typical joint structure. For our foray into a typical joint structure, I am going to look at a joint, um, the knee, rough, roughly. And we can sort of apply these same principles to other joints, although the knee certainly has um, a lot of uniqueness to it, too. Okay, so I'm going to start um, on the inside and kind of move outward. So the first thing I'd like to point out is that wherever um, you have a movable joint like this and the bones are coming together, there will be articular cartilage lining the end of each bone and it gives a smooth glassy surface to the bones to reduce friction. I wonder if you remember what kind of cartilage articular is. If you said hyalin, you're right. So it is hyalin. And it's smooth and glassy, or it should be anyway. So it reduces friction. But we can find problems here. For example, if um, somebody falls and hits their knee really hard, they can have chunks break off, or they can have too much rubbing, it can become roughened. So we could kind of classify those as trauma or maybe overuse. Then you can get a roughened cartilage and uh, specifically articular because there is also other kinds of cartilage in the knee we're going to talk about. So if they're roughened articular cartilage, basically what that person will experience is what we call osteoarthritis. And osteo means bone and arthro means joint. So um, they're having, because the bone is getting roughened on the ends, then they're having inflammation of their joints. Okay, then the next thing um, we can put on there is let's enclose, um, or let's connect the bones with um, two ligaments called the anterior cruciate ligament and the posterior cruciate ligament. anterior one is abbreviated ACL and you've probably heard of that one because it's the most commonly torn one in twisting um, trauma such that you so hear happening to soccer players and football players and then there's also one that crosses behind and that's the PCL and it tears too but not as frequently as the ACL okay then let's enclose the joint with a membrane called the synovial membrane. So you can take a pink pen and so that's the synovial membrane. This word synovial means together like an egg. So it basically synovial fluid is uh, kind of like an egg whitey fluid. And that's where it got named. So this membrane though has cells that makes a slippery fluid, synovial fluid. and its job is to reduce friction in the joint. If the synovial membrane becomes inflamed, we call that rheumatoid arthritis, and that's uh, particularly an autoimmune disease. So 
sometimes shortened to RA. So this is an autoimmune disease. What that indicates is that the person's own, so auto means self, their own white blood cells attack their own synovial membrane. We don't know the cause of a lot of autoimmune diseases, but we are finding frequently that there can be a link with an infection earlier in life, um, or maybe even a food allergy, such as an allergy to gluten, can um, be linked with rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, interestingly, celiac disease also seems to be linked with rheumatoid arthritis, all indicating that antibodies made to a foreign substance such as gluten might then predispose a person to um, having those same antibodies attack their own synovial membranes. So I think I'll even put, there's a strong correlation with gluten sensitivity for RA. As uh, we've talked about at other times, correlation does not equal causation. So that doesn't mean that we know for sure that gluten can um, cause rheumatoid arthritis. There does seem to be an association, meaning people that have a gluten sensitivity are more likely to have RA, or people that have RA are more likely to have a gluten sensitivity. Uh, but nonetheless, if you know someone that has rheumatoid arthritis, it would at least be worth a try for them to remove gluten from their diet for maybe three to six months and see if they have any improvement. Can't hurt. Okay, so next let's put the menisci in. I'm gonna use a purple pen for those. There is a medial, in the knee anyway, a medial and a lateral meniscus. Actually, they extend up to actually attach to the bones. These are fibrocartilage pads. There's two of them in the knee, but you do also have them in a few other joints, such as uh, the shoulder and um, but between where the clavicle attaches to the sternum and to the scapula, you also have a menisci. So they really serve two purposes, cushioning, of course, because they have the glycoproteins in the middle that help to um, cushion, and then uh, stabilization too because they actually connect to the bones above and below. And so if you tear a meniscus, then it's very likely that the knee is um, less stable after that. Okay, next up, let's do the joint capsule. And if you recall from the anatomy of the bone, the periosteum of the bone is actually continuous with the joint capsule, it's the same tissue. So we're using a green highlighter to outline uh, the periosteum, but then in this page, the whole point is we're looking at the joint capsule. And if someone were to need um, a particular invasive surgery into a joint, then this joint capsule would have to be cut through and then sewn back up again when they're done. And this is the periosteum. Okay, then there are a couple more um, ligaments. So we talked about the um, intracapsular ligaments. So the, the ACL and the PCL are actually inside of the joint capsule. And then there are extra um, capsular ligaments too, called the collateral ligaments, and they attach on the outside. And in the knee, 
These are called the medial and lateral collateral ligaments. Sometimes you might call the medial one the tibial uh, collateral ligament and the lateral one the fibular, just depends on which doctor you're talking to. Okay, and then last, but certainly not least, there are many bursa. I think uh, the knee has 14 bursa, and I'll show you a couple places you might find. Oh, actually, I'm gonna use pink, because they're very much like a synovial membrane. So let's use a pink highlighter. There'd be one there, maybe, and there, on the sides of the knee. There are also a couple in the front. Let's kind of put them on there like that. Like I said, there's 14 of them. I think five in the front, and then maybe four on one side and five on the other. Or, let's see, so let's label this up here. Bursa. These are sacs of synovial fluid outside of the joint. So the synovial membrane is inside the joint and then all these other uh, friction reducing little sacs of synovial fluid are called bursa. So you can see that they're really very similar. Bursitis is when those get inflamed. And they even help um, to reduce friction between the skin and the bone. So they are between uh, tendons and bones and even between skin and bones. For example, there's a, um, a bursa that is on top of your patella, so it'd be like, you know, if I'm not having drawn the patella, but let's say it's here and then the bursa sits on top of it and it reduces friction when your skin moves over your patella. And then there's another one down here by the tibial tuberosity and it reduces the friction of the skin moving over the tibial tuberosity. So if you feel your tibial tuberosity, you can get a sense that these are really thin sacs of synovial fluid. They're not like a water balloon. They're very, very thin and provide just enough uh, slipperiness so that the skin doesn't get stuck on the bone. That would hurt, right? You also have plenty of bursa in the shoulder and um, all over your body in most moving joints.